Okay, thank you very much, Gordon. Uh, thank you uh, for uh, that um, introduction. Um, let me just, say for, as a preface remark, just for those of you who are wondering, um, what is different about the beast that we are going to display to you today? And most of the polls that you see us talk about in the media, and you will see me commenting on, on the What Scotland Things website. Um, most opinion polls are conducted in the course of two or three days. Um, they, by a variety of means, get hold of as many people as possible, but you will discover that all of them magically just about managed to get 1,000, and then also magically somehow managed to stop once they've got 1,000 they've got people. Um, this is a very different beast. Um, all of the opinion polls that have been conducted in this referendum are either being done online or they're being done by telephone. With the one exception is TNS BMRB, who are doing it face to face, but they're doing it face to face by what we in the trade call quota sampling. So the interviewers are told to find so many young people, so many women, etc. Scottish Social Arts is different in the sense that what it does is that the poor interviewers, as Penny's already alluded, are given a list of addresses, which we have literally randomly sampled from the postcode address file, which is the list that the post office has of all of the addresses in Scotland. And we say to them, you've got to go and knock on that door, and you've got to keep on knocking on that door until finally you get somebody to answer. And then, of course, there may be more than one person living there, so then the computer will then say to them, okay, tell me how many people, who's living here, and I will then tell you who they have to interview. They have to interview that person, no other person, et cetera, et cetera. So this is what uh, statisticians would call probability sampling. It's what statistical theory suggests, at least, is the way that these things should be done. But the truth is, it is relatively slow, it is relatively expensive, um, and therefore, most of what I'm going to be talking about this morning is not about the minutiae of what happened to leaders' debate, what happened as a result of that speech or whatever, but to take a much longer view about, first of all, well, what really has happened over the last couple of years. Essentially, uh, since the argument about how the referendum should be held was largely settled in October 2012, and then by February 2013, we knew, finally knew what the referendum question was going to be, what's happened over that two-year period? And then, arguably, equally importantly, does public opinion in Scotland now, over the course of the last couple of years, look any different from what it did when we started off on the devolution journey back in 1999? Because, because Scottish social attitudes is done every year, then that's a question that uh, uniquely we can answer. And indeed, Scottish social attitudes has the only time series of where we've asked the same old boring survey question on every survey, every year, and therefore we can actually tra trace the historical trend. Um, many people in my academic community are always desperately keen to invent the new, and I constantly keep on arguing, now if you wish to understand what's new, you need to keep on repeating the old, because that's the only way when you can actually understand whether or not public opinion has shifted. So just to remind you, therefore, Scottish Social Attitudes is done, has been done every year since 1999, so I'm occasionally going to show you graphs all the way back to that, and occasionally back even a little bit earlier, the four most recent surveys, um, I'm giving you an idea of when they were conducted, and in particular, therefore, be aware that both in 2012 and in 2013, they were essentially conducted, at, as it were, in the third quarter of those years. So when we compare things with 2013, essentially we're comparing things with uh, just before the signing of the Edinburgh Agreement, so before, uh, 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 look at things from 2012, think, comparing things just with an agreement. And with 2013, essentially, it's the middle of last year, kind of just before the one year to go uh, 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 deadline, which is really when the opinion polling took off. And meanwhile, the most recent data, the data that's released today, was collected by our standards rather quickly in two months, um, between the middle of May and the middle of July. The data are somewhat interim in the sense that Scottish Social Artists 2014 is actually still going on in the field through to probably about the back end of next week or so. But we have 1,339 of the 1,500 interviews that we expect to get. So there will be a slight revision, but in order to ensure we could get this data out before we hit the pre-referendum period, um, we have uh, done it on the basis of these initial uh, 1,339 interviews. For those of you who are interested, the estimated response rate, and it is an estimate at this stage, is 54%, which is about par for the course 
these days. Okay, so that's the nature of the beast we're dealing with. Those are the comparisons we're, we, are, we are looking at. So when you say, has the referendum made a difference, it's has it made a difference either since the middle of last year or since just before the Edinburgh Agreement. Now, how could the campaign have made a difference, i.e. what questions am I going to ask? Well, the first and most obvious one is actually maybe the level of support for or opposition to independence stroke staying in the United Kingdom may have changed. The aggregate numbers in terms of public opinion may be different now from what they were a year or two years ago. Secondly, and maybe in parallel with that, maybe there's been a change in the kinds of people who are more or less likely to support independence or to support staying inside the UK. Thirdly, it may well be, and this obviously may be something that underlies any changes, there might be changes, first of all, in people's sense of identity, and clearly in part this is a referendum about identity, and it is difficult to think we'll be having this referendum if at least Scotland were not a nation, and a nation many of whose population has a distinct sense of identity that they might want to see reflected in their political arrangements but also people's perceptions of the consequences of A, independence, and B, being inside the Union. Maybe people's views about whether or not independence would be practically beneficial have changed. Maybe their evaluations of the deal that Scotland gets out of the Union have changed. Fourthly, and this is the kind of slightly more social science end of the talk, is, well, actually, it may have done what, I, what I'm going to call crystallising opinion. Now, one of the things that arguably, standing back here as a Democrat rather than as either a yes or no supporter, one of the things that we rather like campaigns to do is that they do provide a way of informing the electorate about the subject matter upon which they're being invited to vote. And that therefore it'd be quite good, arguably, that if indeed we could discover that during the course of the campaign, people's intentions to vote either yes or no are more clearly a reflection of either their sense of identity or what they think the consequences of independence would be, etc. i.e., it looks as though what sometimes political scientists call an informed vote, as opposed to maybe, they, maybe they're just voting on the basis they don't like the colour of Alex Salmon's hair or they don't like uh, uh, um, uh, Alistair Darling's eyebrows, or et cetera, et cetera. In other words, that they're focused on things that seem to be relevant rather than apparently casting an ephemeral vote behind which there seemed to be relatively little information. Alongside that, of course, if indeed opinion is being crystallised, people might also subjectively feel, you know, well, yeah, I've learned something in the last two years. Yeah, I'm you know, I kind of think I know what I'm doing. We could also, but I'm not going to talk about this because Jan and Lindsay are going to talk about this, we would also normally expect a, a campaign in a referendum or for an election to also make it more likely that people are going to vote, that it mobilises people, that it persuades them that indeed the, the election or the referendum matters and that therefore as a result it merits their attention and merits their participation in this case on the 18th of September. So that's what I'm going to look at except the last thing which we'll get in the subsequent talk. Okay, part one then. What have we uncovered so far as measures of support are concerned? Um, the first measure here, and this is to enable me to take, to look, to take, the, uh, to take the long view, is uh, this is the question that Scottish Social Attitudes has been asking every year since 1999. Indeed, in fact, it first appeared on a question that Lindsay Patterson, Sorry, Lindsay Patterson David McCrone did in 1997 in that year's Scottish election study. Now, I mean, those of you who are aficionados of this scene will kind of go, God, that looks a bit like a 1990s question. And it is a bit like a 1990s question, you know. It reminds us of the days when the SNP were still arguing about whether they wanted inside the European Union, as opposed to the current argument about whether or not an independent Scotland would be allowed to stay inside the European Union. And it also reminds us that a certain T. Blair had certain collywobbles about the idea of giving the Scottish Parliament tax varying powers, and that therefore uh, maybe this would be a separate option. Indeed, it was a second question on the 1997 referendum. That said, however, has already suggested the great advantage of this, although it's somewhat out of date and it doesn't refer to more devolution, about which Jan and Lindsay will say rather more, um, the great advantage is that it does enable us to track opinion over time. And hereafter, I am simply going to collapse the first two items and say that's independence. I'm going to collapse the third and fourth items and say that's devolution. And the fifth item, of course, is why do we have that Scottish point at the bottom of the Royal Mile to house all those numpties we never, ever really wanted it in the first place. Okay, 
Now, what looking at this question does is enables us to address the question, is support for independence as this campaign is drawing to a close any higher now than it has been for most of the period since 1999? To which the answer is, and what you need to follow here is the middle line of this track, this is the level of support for independence, is, well, certainly support for independence now is markedly higher than it was a couple of years ago, but a couple of years ago, we were saying, you know what, one of the consequences of having the SNP in power is that actually, if anything, support for, the, for independence seems to be rather lower these days. Uh, because now you have that cheeky chappy in Butte House defending Scotland's interests, we don't seem to quite see the point of it anymore. So to that extent, at least, it's pretty clear that the independence campaign and the referendum campaign has indeed helped to restore support for independence towards what looks like effectively the high end of the range within which it's oscillated since, since 1999. Um, but it isn't quite a record for what it's worth. It was 35% in 2005. Now the two figures are not statistically significantly different. So essentially, therefore, what one has to say is it looks as though the referendum campaign has ensured that the yes side has mobilized what looked like its existing potential inside the Scottish electorate. But it is not clear that it has succeeded in reaching beyond that achievement. And to that extent, at least, it's not clear that public opinion in Scotland on this issue is dramatically different now from what it has been for most of the period since 1999. That, however, is not the referendum question. Maybe that people are going to vote differently in the referendum from what they get from a, in responding to a 1990s question like this. So let's look to see what they say when asked the referendum question. Now, we do have done this in exactly the same way as last year, and we do it in a very particular way, using, first of all, the initial wording, where, where as you can see, it is people are really invited to say, look, I've not quite decided, if they really haven't quite decided. So in interpreting the numbers of undecideds in the surveys, you need to be aware we are making it easy for people to say they're undecided. Having done that, however, what we then go on to do is to say to those, well, OK, fine, look, I, know, I know you've not quite made your mind up, but look, what do you think you're most likely to do? And as you can see, as you will see, we can get quite a lot of people then to respond to that question. So to walk you through what therefore is a slightly complicated picture, let me go from left to right on this diagram. On the left-hand side, I'm showing you the proportion of people who say yes, no, or don't know, and the don't knows include a small number of people who say, look, I'm not going to vote, go away. Um, but, but otherwise, they're all undecided. So in response to our initial question, 25% of people say, I'm going to vote yes, 43% say I'm going to vote no, and 33% are undecided or um, uh, I'm not going to uh, darken the polling station's door. We then ask the follow-up question to those people, but only those people, who said they were undecided. And as you can see, when we do that, 42% of them say, look, I, I really, really don't know what I'm going to do. But thereafter, the remainder split more or less evenly between those who I think they're going to vote yes and those who are going to vote no. So amongst the undecideds here, there seems to be somewhat more uh, potential for the yes side than there is amongst the supposedly more firmly committed. We can then add together the first two columns so that the 33% in the third set of columns is the proportion of people who said either, yeah, I'm definitely voting yes, or I think I'm going to vote yes as a proportion of the sample. The 51% are the percentage of people who said they're going to vote no, and the 12% is the proportion of the sample who are still determinedly undecided. Then, as I've been gradually encouraging the journalistic community to do, if you want to understand, therefore, what this means in terms of a referendum vote, we should then simply take the undecideds out, take the undecideds out, and we are looking at a 39% vote for yes, 61% for no. How does that compare with what we said last year? Last year we said it was 36% for yes, 64% for no. So you will now note that as compared with last year, we have a three-point increase in the yes vote on the referendum vote. We had a four-point increase on our old-fashioned question. And those of you who have been following the campaign will be aware that those two figures match pretty much exactly the increase in the average level of support for yes, once the don't knows are excluded, in the middle of this year, 
as compared with the middle of last year. So you may or may not think that this helps to enhance the validity of what we've got, but basically the trend that we have identified in the survey in 2014 as compared with 2013 matches exactly the average change in the opinion polls during this period. One other thing to note, which you also realise if I take you back to the third pair of, third trio of uh, columns, is that we had 33% support in our uh, old-fashioned question. We've got 33% support for yes. And yes, you've guessed it, virtually everybody who says they're going to vote yes said they were in favour of independence. And virtually everybody who said they're in favour of independence says they're in favour of yes. The two questions for all practical purposes, about 10% of the sample who don't quite manage it, but, uh, but, but everybody else manages it. So therefore, actually, when I'm wanting to look at the, the campaign and the trends over time, I'm often going to use the old-fashioned question because that gives me a longer lens. But you can be assured if we redo the analysis doing the yes, doing, using the referendum question, you will get the same answer. OK. More quickly now, how have um, the demographics changed? Um, Rachel's going to talk about this this afternoon. You probably heard her talking, for those of you who were up early this morning, you would have heard her talking about it on the Today programme. Has the gender gap closed? No. Actually, we've got a record gender gap. Maybe that's true, maybe not. But the point is, there is no evidence in our survey that the gender gap, which is persistent, it's gone all the way back since 1999, has been closed by the referendum campaign. Second thing that's tended to be true is that, as I now put it, those folk who have the misfortune to be somewhat older than I am tend to be less likely to be in favour of independence. Um, i.e., I'm not quite 65, but the 65 pluses on this, on this diagram, as you can see, have persistently tended to be less likely to be in favour of independence. That effectively has not changed. Thirdly, one of the things that has tended to be true, it's not dramatic, it's there, um, is that it's tended to be the case that those people uh, using the language of government statisticians who are in routine and semi-routine occupations or what we used to call the working class, are somewhat more likely to be in favour of independence than everybody else, and particularly those in professional and managerial occupations. Now, the professional and managerial occupations look a little bit more favourable, and that's something that Jan and Lindsay will come on to. Um, but it still remains the case that the folk in working class occupations look a little bit more in favour. Finally, um, and, and as on what slightly wider gap, um, is that it's also quite clear that those folk who are living in the more deprived parts of Scotland are more likely to be in favour. That's one of the reasons why every time a journalist rings up the Yes campaign and says, where should I go? They say, go to the east end of Glasgow, because that's where we're focusing our effort. That explains why they're focusing their effort on places like the east end of Glasgow. Um, but the truth is, it's always been true that those parts of Scotland have been more likely to be in favour. It is not obvious that that is any different now, and certainly uh, the gap between those living in the least deprived areas and the most deprived areas is exactly the same this year as it was last year. So not entirely sure that all these efforts have made much difference. So the demography essentially has not changed. So this is one where, area where the campaign doesn't really seem to have made much of a difference. Okay. What about trends in the perceptions that we might think have something to do with whether or not people are more or are less likely to vote yes or no? Um, the first uh, one is, of course, as I've suggested, inevitably this is partly a referendum about identity. Um, what about Scotland's pattern of identity? Um, the, what I'm showing you here are the responses to a question which is known in the trade as the Moreno question after the uh, Spanish political scientist Luis Moreno, um, which invites people to choose on a spectrum from I am Scottish and I am not British through various Heinz varieties of combination of being Scottish and British through to the other end, I am British and I am not Scottish. Point one to note is that it remains the case, as has always been the case, there are not very many people in Scotland who either say I am wholly British or I am primarily British. And to that extent, at least, nothing has changed. Whatever you will note, and I have to admit, we've been kind of quite cautious in about pointing this out, but I think finally we should do so, is that if you now look at the bottom column, and leaving aside the position in 1997, where again it was also relatively low, but if you look during the years of devolution, 
what you will see is that it looks as though in recent years, the proportion of people who say, I am Scottish and I am not British, has gone down. Now, this first emerged in our 2012 survey, so this is not the referendum campaign as a process certainly changing things. If this is to do with the referendum campaign, it is the fact that the referendum is now clearly on the horizon maybe making a difference. We were cautious in 2012 because our 2012 survey, for the most part, occurred immediately after the London Olympics. And we went, well, OK, maybe, you know, maybe the, maybe the commentators are right, are right and our Britishness was stimulated, and it will disappear. Well, it was still there last year, rather lower. OK. It's still there this year. So I think we now have to conclude this is not enough, simply a phenomenon of the London Olympics, that something has indeed changed at the margins, and that it looks as though the prospect of the referendum being on the horizon seems to have reminded some people that perhaps they are British as well as Scottish. Notice that the proportion of people who say they are equally British and Scottish is now at its highest. And it's, it's not necessarily that people are denying their Scottishness and saying, oh, look, I'm really British after all. It's that they now seem to be rather more willing to acknowledge their Britishness alongside their Scottishness. Um, that said, if you do the nasty on them and you force them to choose and you say, come on, right, what are you, British or Scottish? In line with the trend I've just shown you, the proportion of people who, when forced to choose, say, I am Scottish, is now down to two-thirds, when at one stage it was as high as 80%, and there's been a modest increase in the proportion who, when forced to choose, say they are British. Equally, I can show this to you another way. This is a, a question for the inspiration of which we owe a debt of gratitude to David McCrone. David McCrone, we kind of, you know, finally we kind of said, oh God, why didn't we do this years ago? Rather than asking people, you know, are you more British and Scottish or whatever, we just ask them separately, how British are you and how Scottish are you? Here's the figures for how British are you. Back in 2011, 10% of people giving themselves a mark of six out of seven for how British they were, 17% giving themselves a mark of seven out of seven. Now we're looking at 17% saying six out of seven, 21% saying they are seven out of seven. So however you measure it, on all three of our measures, a somewhat stronger sense of British identity in the Scottish public. It looks as though the prospect of having a referendum, at least, has helped to rekindle this to a degree, and it is only to a degree, in the minds of the Scottish public. What, about, what does Scotland think about the union? I've already kind of suggested that actually maybe um, people aren't quite so unhappy about the union. Um, and this is one example of where, indeed, public opinion in Scotland has appeared to be rather more sympathetic to the union in recent years uh, than it had been previously. It's showing you what people in Scotland think about whether or not Scotland does or doesn't get a fair share of its public spending. In the early years of devolution, we still thought we was being robbed. We were inclined to think we got less than our fair share. In more recent years, we've been inclined to, there have been at least as many people thinking we get pretty much our fair share as think we get less than our fair share. And that really hasn't changed. So to that extent, it, it's kind of opened out a bit. But the truth is, it's still only minor, uh, uh, less than half of people in Scotland now think we're being hard done by. Second measure, however, things have kind of moved somewhat more cyclically. This is a question where we say to people, whose economy benefits more from the union? Is it England's or it's Scotland's? Again, in the early years of devolution, far more people said it was Scot England's than it was Scotland's. It then, with the, two, with the SNP first coming to power in 2007, the position narrowed and almost equal numbers are choosing the two. I, I'm not showing you, by the way, the people who said it's equal. It's gone back again to being rather more people saying that it's England's than Scotland's, but it's not back to the status quo ante. So somewhat of a revival of, hang on, we're being hard done by, but not back to the position that it was for the most part before the SNP came to the power. So our views of the union may have become, again, a bit more critical during the referendum campaign, but they're still not as critical as they were in the early years of devolution. One other thing that we picked out last year as being apparently quite important for people is how they thought the welfare state should be funded. Should it be funded out of Scottish-only taxes, or should it be funded out of UK-wide taxes? The former is the implication of independence. The latter is the prospect being offered by the no side if Scotland decides to vote no. 
Um, the left hand of each of these columns shows you the proportion of people who think that unemployment benefit in Scotland should be funded out of Scottish only taxes. The right hand column is the proportion of people who think that it should be funded out of the UK as a whole. First two columns, unemployment, 2013, 2014. Two right hand columns, same figures for pensions. What I invite you to note is that rather more people now think that both unemployment benefit and pensions should be paid for in Scotland out of UK-wide taxes rather than out of Scottish-only taxes. So this is something that appears to have moved in the favour of the no side. Finally, but by no means least, we have a series of questions in which we say to people, OK, what do you think is going to happen if Scotland were to become independent? Do you think more people would have pride in the country or fewer people? Do you think Scotland's voice in the world will be stronger or weaker? Do you think its economy will be better or worse? What I invite you to note is, particularly if you compare 2014 with 2012, is that on each and every of these questions where we can make that comparison, the proportion of people who think that things are going to be better is at least a little lower than it was two years ago, and the proportion of people who think that things would now be worse is at least a little higher than it was two years ago. And that it looks as though, during the course of this referendum campaign, people in Scotland have become somewhat more sceptical, if that's the right word, less likely to be enamoured of the practical arguments in favour of independence than they were at the beginning of the referendum campaign. Which is probably making you see, think to yourself, hang on, hasn't he just said two completely, utterly contradictory things? One, you're telling us that support for independence has gone up by 10 points since 2012, but you're also telling us that the electorate in Scotland are now somewhat more critical of the case for independence than they once were. How can this possibly be? Well, this is what takes us on to the argument about crystallisation. Um, I'm not going to spend a great deal of time with this, but for the aficionados in this room, um, this is what happens if you try to statistically model the uh, people who are willing to vote yes rather than to vote no. I'm not going to spend a great deal of time on this. What I invite you to note is that it was the economy stupid in 2013 as being the thing that was most, is most strongly related. It's the economy stupid again in 2014. The second thing I will invite you to note is that although identity is there, it does come into the equation. It's by no means number one. It's a little way down the list before eventually it makes it. Third thing I'll invite you to note is that for the most part, the two lists are broadly similar to each other. One or two things are up, one or two things are down, and I'm going to go and walk you through that in the slides that follow. Okay, has opinion crystallized? The answer is yes. Here's exhibit number one. This is now looking yes, no, this is the proportion saying they're going to vote yes, according to, first of all, whether or not you think the economy is going to be better or worse. So the 86% on the far left-hand side is that in last year's survey, amongst those people who said that, economic that we think the economy would be a lot better under independence, 86% of that group said they were going to vote yes in the referendum. That figure has gone up from 86 to 92 but more clearly and more dramatically, the proportion of people who think it's going to be a little better under independence, the proportion of yes voters amongst that group was 67% last year, and it is now 83% this year. So in other words, the gap between, in terms of the proportion voting yes, on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side has got bigger, Therefore, statistically, it's now much more clearly related between the two. And substantively, therefore, basically, increase, now it's now more clearly the case that the people who do think that there is a practical argument, so far as in the economy is concerned, in favour of independence, are more likely to back that view with a yes vote. And conversely, however, virtually nobody who thinks that the idea of uh, independence uh, creating a better economy is, it has got any legs behind it. Virtually none of those are, are voting for it. So that's what I mean by crystallization, that the link between people's views of independence or whatever and 
their um, uh, vote is stronger now than it once was. Um, it's even clearer if you now use the 1990s question in order to look over a longer time frame, go back to 2012, even amongst those who thought the economy would be a lot better, only 73% were uh, saying they were in favor of independence, that figure is now 88. Notice again the big jump amongst those who think independence would make the economy a little better. So over the two year period of the referendum, the crystallization is even clearer and sharper and more obvious. So, for those of you who are still wondering how, how these two things go together, it's possible for the yes vote to go up, even though we've become more critical collectively about independence, because those people who are convinced of the practical case for independence are now more likely to vote in favor of it. Or to put it slightly differently, the pot of people who think that independence is a good idea may be smaller, but now the yes side are more effective in corralling those people who are inside that pot into the yes camp. Um, much the same thing is true if we look at people's evaluations of whether or not Scotland's voice in the world will be stronger or weaker. Notice again how the bars on the left-hand side are now higher than they once were. The ones on the right-hand side are much as they were. Uh, the degree to which Scotland's voice in the world is stronger makes a difference is now uh, stronger. Uh, and that's also true if we need convincing over the shorter term so far as referendum vote choice is concerned. Um, equally, and although it's not as good a distinguisher as is what people think about the economy, the other practical leg behind the Yes Sides campaign, which is an independent Scotland would be a more equal Scotland, that is now also more clearly related to vote choice than it once was. Notice particularly now the folk who only think going to be a little better because that's where most of the think people who are convinced of the case of equality are is now much more clearly a yes vote than it once was. So to that extent, at least the yes campaign have made something that wasn't clearly an issue even last year something of an issue in voters' minds. Um, on the other hand, well, national identity does matter somewhat more than it did. So notice that on the left-hand side, on the right left-hand side here, the level of support for independence amongst those who are Scottish, not British, or more Scottish than British than somewhat higher than it was. And if we leave aside that 18%, which is based on a very small sample size, it really hasn't changed on the right-hand side. So there's a bit of a strengthening here, but it's quite modest. And notice how even amongst those people who say that I am Scottish and I am not British, support for yes and for independence is only at 60%. So while a lot of newspapers this morning got terribly interested about the decline of British identity, and it's kind of, it is kind of interesting, isn't it? This is kind of a change of the backcloth to the campaign rather than something that's clearly central to voters' choice. Um, on the other hand, what isn't now that more clearly strongly related to support for independence than was the case a year ago, are people's perceptions of the deal that Scotland gets out of the Union, whether or not you think England benefits as opposed to Scotland. Actually, the numbers have gone up a little bit on both sides. The relationship is much the same. And meanwhile, actually, despite Gordon Brown's best efforts to try and make this an issue in the campaign, actually, um, the, uh, the degree to which people's views as to whether or not they would prefer their pensions to be paid for out of a UK-wide pool rather than a Scotland-only pool has actually become less clearly related to whether they're willing to vote yes or no. Support for um, uh, no amongst those people um, uh, who uh, want the UK as a whole to fund pensions has actually gone up from 14% to 24%. So that issue actually has become rather less important. So it is the argument about independence that seems to have become centre stage much more clearly than certainly um, people's views of the union and also to some extent independence. So finally, if indeed people are now apparently reflecting their views of independence more clearly in the way in which they intend to vote, does this mean that they now think that it's all a little bit clearer to them. Well, actually, no. <laughs> Ask people, how much do you think you know about independence? And we've still got 34% of people saying not very much or nothing, and only just over a quarter saying, yeah, yeah, I really know a lot about this. 
So subjectively, we still feel rather in the dark. And that is also reflected when we ask people, and this is something that Rachel's going to talk much more about, how sure are you about what would happen if Scotland became independent? This is an entirely separate question from the ones I've shown you so far. And we've still got about 60% of people saying, you know what, I'm not, I'm not, not terribly sure what's going to happen. And that's not good news for the no side, because even if I think the economy will be better under independence, but I go on to say, not terribly sure about it all, though, I'm less likely to vote yes. So, there you go. Yes, we've not been wasting our time in the last two years. You'll be pleased to hear. The balance of opinion has changed so far as support for yes or no is concerned. The balance of opinion has changed on some of the crucial issues underlying the campaign. But arguably, crucially, for those of us who are interested in the quality of democracy, as opposed to whether or not Scotland votes yes or no, arguably also this campaign has done some good in helping to ensure that the vote that's cast on the 8th of September will reflect Scotland's collective judgment on the merits of the arguments put before it. We may not still be doing so with a great deal of self-confidence, but maybe underneath that, some of what's been said has percolated through and has helped to ensure that whatever is the outcome, it will be a reasonably well-informed one.